So let me introduce myself. My name is John Bell and I'm a minister in the Church of Scotland, the Mother Church of Presbyterianism. But I don't have a parish. Uh, I work for an ecumenical association called the Iona Community. It takes its name from the small island where we have our uh, conference centres, which is the place, Iona, where in 563, the great evangelist Columba came from Ireland to change the face of Scotland. I speak neither as an academic nor a frustrated academic. That's not my calling. Uh, I work occasionally in seminaries and churches all over the world. And my primary passions are to do with liturgy and enabling lay people to feel comfortable in the relationship to the scripture and articulating their faith. So my starting point for this uh, paper is with regard to palliative care. I think there's too much of it. Now, I'm not referring to medical assistance and pastoral and spiritual support given to people who are dying. I'm referring to what seems like a superabundance of saccharine piety, which churches have been offering to people in response to the pandemic, which is unilaterally affecting the world. Of course, when faced with a virus which is largely indiscriminate in the range of people affected, it's right that the churches should offer consolation, the comfort of religion. People need to know God's love mediated through sensitive care, well-chosen words, scripture and the sacraments. Believers need to be reminded that nothing in the heights or the depths can separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. With all of this, I concur. And in a small way, I've contributed to this pastoral ministry. Eight weeks ago, a Norwegian songwriter, Hans Olaf Merck, sent me a literal translation of a text he'd written and asked if I, if I could put it into English poetry, which would fit his Norwegian tune. Well, I did that. And then I took his kernel idea and reworked it with a tune of my own. But here's the text. We will meet when the danger is over. We will meet when the sad days are done. We will meet sitting closely together and be glad that tomorrow has come. We will join to give thanks and sing gladly. We'll join to break bread and share wine. And the peace which we pass to each other will be more than a casual sign. So let's make with each other a promise that when all we've come through is behind, we will share what we've missed and find meaning in the things that once troubled our mind. Until then, may we always discover faith and love to determine our way that's our hope and God's will and our calling for our lives and for every new day. So I'm not exempting myself from pastoral engagement, but I do believe that this is not all that people of faith have to offer. And I want to suggest three possible trajectories. A vocabulary for lament, a theological critique of the pandemic and a reimagining of the future. So I begin with lament. I received an email two weeks ago from a church musician who was asking what people might sing which would allow for the articulation of their feelings of anxiety and anger and distress. There wasn't anything which immediately came to her mind. It was as if this kind of expression either went against the grain of Christian positivism or we just didn't have a vocabulary for it. It took me back to an evening uh, in 2004, 16 years ago, in Minneapolis, where I treated a younger, three younger colleagues to a theatrical event which I had seen before they were conceived. The name of the show was Hair. I saw it when I was 21. I remembered it and I can still sing some of the short songs. I remember its multicoloured cast, their psychedelic clothes, and 30 seconds of full nudity on stage. What I had forgotten was that this was a protest musical. The central character was a boy who decided not to flee the draft by going to Canada, but to leave his hippie friends and be drafted to Vietnam, where he was killed. It came to the end of the performance. The audience rose to cheer an excellent production and cast. And then one of the minor characters came to the apron of the stage and motioned for silence. He said, we're so glad to be playing to you tonight in Minneapolis. But just today we discovered that the first female in the military 
to be killed in the current Gulf War came from this city. We also discovered that there's a fund set up in her memory. The money from it is going to look after Iraqi children who've been orphaned or wounded in the Allied bombing. So after every performance, we're going to stand outside with buckets as you leave. And if you wish, you can make a donation to this fund to help these desolate kids in Iraq. And then from this adult audience standing on their feet came the sound of weeping. Grown men weeping. This was at a time when the Patriot Act had forbidden public criticism of the government and when songs by a girl band called the Dixie Chicks had been pulled from public performance. This anti-Vietnam musical, which protested against the pursuit of death, had voiced what no contemporary musical in 2004 would have been allowed to do. And in donating to a fund set up in memory of a local girl who'd been killed in Iraq, people were perhaps making their first tangible sign of their discontent with a war now in its second of eight years. In the 60s and 70s, there was a vocabulary given the public by its artists to articulate their rawness of feeling. Not just songs which would say things will happen better in the future, but anthems like Blowing in the Wind. Protest and lament are very old traditions. They were important in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. The voices of a people who sang out their belief that things had to change and sang out their pain. The national anthem of those who lived under apartheid, who suffered under it, was not in Kosi Sikaleli Africa. That's a pan-African song. No, the anthem of those who suffered was much shorter, one word per verse. Sen zeni na. What have we done wrong? So no say to. What is our sin? It didn't come from a Hollywood composer. It came from the Bible. When David was being threatened by Absalom, he turns to God and says, what have I done wrong? What is my sin? I have a fascination with African-American spirituals because they often with few words and fewer notes have offered the pain of persecuted people to their God and to each other. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Sometimes I'm up. Sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. But of course, those of us who have some allegiance to the Jewish or Christian traditions shouldn't need to go to Africa or black America for vocabulary to articulate, articulate pain, anger, disappointment, frustration, victimization. It's all there in the Psalms. If only we can see beyond those used primarily for palliative care. Last year, I was working on a book about the Psalms, not a commentary, but a series of reflections and insights which came from discussing them with a whole range of people. Whenever in groups I raise the issue of Psalm 88, which is not in the lectionary, it's the bleakest psalm of them all, I was amazed at the number of people who responded positively. People who'd, who'd been in the depths, a girl who had lost her brother, he took suicide. A woman, a very poor woman in the north of Glasgow who'd gone through horrendous troubles in her midlife. A diocese of the Anglican Church, which had been torn in two. Something in these questions to God and these angry words allowed for the expression of what polite faith would regard as inadmissible. There are a fair number of Psalms which deal with personal and social injustice. My friend Doug Gay is a lecturer at the Glasgow University School of Divinity, and he worked on a singable text of Psalm 52. Psalm 52 in the Bible says, You mighty man, why do you boast all the day of your infamy against God's loyal servant? So Doug uh, put this in a more poetic form. You cunning liar, why publicize your evil need to harm the good? Your slanderous tongue is razor sharp, honed to fulfill malicious plans. You love the lie and hate the truth. May God rise up to pull you down, uproot and sweep you far away. Then may the just look on aghast and mock the one who valued wealth, who trusted riches more than God. God let me, 
like a spreading tree grow, as I trust in your sure love. Where loyal servants offer praise within your house, I'll add my voice to glorify your holy name. I have a profound conviction that whether we are the victims of a global pandemic or want to intercede for those who are most affected, or whether we want to show solidarity with a persecuted and neglected people like the Rohingya Muslims from Myanmar or the black community in the USA, which is victims of three plagues, COVID-19, unemployment and white racism. We can keep hope alive, not just by singing the praise of God, but also by articulating the pain of the people. Indeed, I wonder if we have any right to shout hallelujah if we have never asked how long. Well, secondly, the trajectory in theology. I'm interested in what theological understandings we share about the global pandemic, because I've not heard much articulated. I suppose there are two polarities which, at least to me, are equally unattractive. At one end of the spectrum, we have the sin sniffers, people who enjoy identifying iniquity in the same way as some individuals enjoy bad health. It all comes down to guilt and sin, that's what they would claim. It goes right back to the fall and to the inherited congenital moral malformation called original sin. I imagine that the American evangelist Pat Robertson might be pursuing this line, though I speak under correction. Exactly what the iniquity is, is never identified. To say that the pandemic is caused by sin is wholly insufficient. Is it personal sin or is it corporate sin? Has it a root, a source, a furtive intention? Or is it the work of the devil, who, as in the case of Job, has been given free reign by God to visit hardship on innocent people to test their fidelity? At the other end of the theological, liturgical and emotional spectra are those who would claim that it's best not to dwell on it because we can't really do anything about it. Much better to pray harder, Trust more and sing with ever great enthusiasm. God has promised to shield his own and God keeps his promise. This is a very attractive mindset, as long as you don't fall prey to COVID-19. And on both sides of the Atlantic, there have been religious snake oil salesmen offering their own brand of this kind of spiritual panacea. I find neither of these caricatures satisfying. But what do you say? to explain or offer a context to what is wholly unjust and all-pervasive. I want to offer two perspectives which I don't imagine will be popular, but I think they at least should be rehearsed. What we are dealing with as regards the global pandemic is not just a menacing disease, but our own finitude. Just as some people shy away from engaging with a person who has a mental or physical disability because, if they're honest, they don't know what to say or do. So in the face of a global pandemic, we're lost for words, for a fail-safe response. This is not a broken leg which might heal or a cancer which might respond to chemotherapy. We can't say to people who suspect they have the disease, I'm sure they'll be all right with any deep certainty. We are confronted with an invisible agent which all the wealth, military might and accrued knowledge of experts has been unable to quickly exterminate or tame. We are confronted with our own finitude. We are not gods. And that's easier to say than it is to believe. It's the dilemma of Job. We are neither his sense of his own righteousness, nor his comforter's conviction regarding sin, are able to fathom what has happened. In the West, I think we have subconsciously believed, though I don't know on what basis, that this current plague should not be happening to us. Some years ago, I was working in Hawaii, in Hilo, in the Big Island. And one day, those of us who were not native islanders were taken up to an observation point near the rim of an active volcano. An islander explained that if and when the volcano threatened eruption, it was important to establish the direction, the likely direction of the lava flow 
so that people could move out of their homes. It struck me that if I lived on that island, I wouldn't consider living anywhere apart from the coast, given the possibility of a volcanic eruption. But the islanders don't think that way. For, the rest, for them, risk and uncertainty are givens which they have to live with. Whereas most Western urbanites regard risk and uncertainty as things to be avoided. At the core of this, especially for people of the Judea Christian tradition, is a common misreading of Genesis chapter 1. In that great hymn of creation, there's a constant refrain God saw that it was good. And at the end of the creation cycle, the approval rating is even higher. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Good but not perfect. Good, but not perfect. It is not that creation has a moral defect, but that it has fault lines, of which the San Andreas Fault in California is among the best known. Creation has logical inconsistencies, as when some Australian gum trees burst into flame, not for the purpose of extermination, but as a means of germination. Creation has inexplicable irregularities. The other morning, I listened to an expert on snails talk of how years ago he was given a snail called Jeremy whose shell coiled to the left and not to the right. He's now bred four generations to see if there was a genetic transmission of this irregularity to the snail's progeny, but none has appeared with a left coiling shell. There's no explanation for it. The nations which believe they are invincible have the most difficulty in dealing with menacing, untamable threats. We know what we should do with our country if it's the object of a trade embargo or invasive enemy surveillance. We can use our power, our ingenuity to deal with this. But we have no immediate defence against the threats to our existence which come from a world which we presume to be, predict uh, to be perfect and predictable rather than good, but prone to casuistry. We have to learn to live with our limitations. And that leads to my second perspective. I think that we all have heard the perception that we are given by God dominion over the earth, but not domination. There is an integrity in creation which is not ours to alter. And so we have to live in a symbiotic relationship with nature. We were alerted to this in Scotland when some years ago a mining conglomerate offered to fell a mountain on the island of Harris and dig a huge quarry to extract stone which would be shattered into aggregate for road building throughout Europe. I'd love to discuss the issue in detail but this is not the occasion. What I want to allude to is the government inquiry at which proponents and opponents of the plan presented their cases. And among the, the opponents were two very different men. One was large and dressed in robes and headgear of a Canadian First Nation chief. He was Chief Stone Eagle of the Mi'kmaq Nation. The other was a much lighter figure, a native of Harris, a Gaelic speaker and a professor of theology, Donald MacLeod. Their testimonies were remarkably similar. Donald MacLeod's was the more biblical. And one of the stunning observations he made was that we seem bound to the assumption that humanity is mandated to till the earth. Donald, who's a Hebrew scholar, indicated that the word to till was more commonly rendered in Hebrew as to serve. We are the servants of the earth. The Pentateuch records that there should be a right relationship between humanity and the planet we live on. The story of Noah has God throw into the sky his bow, which was not initially a symbol of gay pride, but of war. God's weapon of mass destruction will never again be used to annihilate the natural world. But humanity does not make a similar covenant with the earth. And so it's the prophets and the poets who use graphic language to alert the human race to how its own existence depends on living in a complementary relationship with nature. 
Thus Jeremiah, your wrongdoing has upset nature's order and your sins have kept away her bounty. Haggai, it is your fault that heavens withhold their moisture and the earth its produce. More graphically still, Isaiah, the earth lurches like a drunkard. The sins of its inhabitants weigh heavily on it. It falls to rise no more. Few theologians really have dealt with the intrinsic relationship between humanity and the natural order. I think the first I remember was Paul Tillich in one of his published sermons called Nature Mourns a Lost Good. The reason for our gross neglect in this matter is because it's only recently, post the Industrial Revolution, that nature has begun to negatively affect us. And rather than re-establish a proper relationship, we go for mastery rather than servanthood. The agrochemical industry will produce better fertilizers. The pharmachem industry will produce better vaccines, highly commendable, but sticking plasters on a running sewer. We have to opt for servanthood and not mastery. So finally to my third trajectory, which is to do with reimagining the future. In 1941, the then Archbishop of York, later of Canterbury, was called William Temple. And in 1941, he brought together an assemblage of people in the town of Malvern in England to discuss what Britain should be like after the war was over. Exact details of the proceedings are not known. It was more of an ideas market than a general synod. But Temple soon afterwards wrote up a summary of the proceedings, and he shared these with William, later Lord, Beveridge. Their collective musings helped shape what in Britain is called the welfare state, the NHS, maternity benefit, pensions, unemployment benefit, and so on. The people who met with William Temple were not all theologians. They included prestigious names from the more artistic side of the social spectrum, including the novelist Dorothy Sayers and T.S. Eliot, the poet and academic. It's worth remembering the power of artists and artistry to influence society, especially when in recent years the arts have suffered from underfunding. During the apartheid era in South Africa, the market theatre from Johannesburg travelled the world portraying the face of racial discrimination. No one who saw their productions left unmoved. Years ago, perhaps 40, 50 years ago, in Japan, an artist called Sadao Watanabe produced pictures which appear in the Vatican and in the British Museum. This is not one of them, but it's his. And if you look at this picture, you can see that the figures are not exactly Western. Watanabe was the first Japanese artist to dare, in a very conservative Christian culture, to dare to represent the people of Scripture and Jesus as Japanese. And what that did almost, not overnight, but fairly quickly, was to allow the incarnation to be a Japanese event and not a Western event. Just four months ago, I watched a DVD of a production of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Uh, there are virtually no props, uh, minimal costume, and played with the audience in the round. It was very different from the proscenium stage production I saw with actors in period costume and received pronunciation accents when I was 16. And the difference was not least because all the, acts, all the actors used an accent native to their own particular part of the United Kingdom, but also because all the actors in Julius Caesar were female. It revealed the scheming, jealousy and lust for power which an all-male cast could never have done so effectively. It was very pertinent to the present situations in the two major English-speaking imperial nations. The arts have the potential, through words, music, acting, physical movement, and concrete depiction, 
of not just capturing what has been, but allowing a glimpse of what might be. Because the arts rely not just on rational thinking and proven skill, but on imagination. Imagination is a commodity which is at the centre of all hopeful and progressive human endeavour. It does not just enable books and plays to be written, it encourages scientific research because the imagination does not pose the question, what has happened? It poses the question, what if? It's how battles are won. The rules of war are one thing, but the strategies to take the enemy by surprise are entirely another. One of the great strategists in this regard was Nelson Mandela. In his attempt to dismantle apartheid and unite a bitterly divided nation. His biography records how, not long into his presidency, he decided that as one senior citizen, he would pay a courtesy visit to another of his age who was celebrating her birthday. The woman in question was Mevrouw Betsy Verwoerd, the widow of Henrik Verwoerd, the architect of apartheid the Prime Minister who had transferred it from a theological perspective to a political movement. He'd been assassinated 30 years previously. Why did Mandela, who had been incarcerated by the political regime Ver Verwoerd initiated, go to have a birthday tea with his widow? You can imagine how black widows must have felt who had lost their brothers, their fathers, husbands because of the apartheid regime. They must have been outraged. But Mandela did that and other highly imaginative symbolic acts because only when he, without words, demonstrated what reconciliation cost and looked like could others catch a glimpse of a different future. He wasn't the first leader to share food with a perceived enemy woman. Both Elijah and Elisha had done that. It's recorded in the history books and when Jesus chose to allude to these imaginative prophetic actions in his home synagogue, the congregation turned against him. Imagination is not, as some suspect, the enemy of faith, but the ally. It's what enables the prophets to offer a glimpse of a new day, of racial harmony, of peace with and within nature, of weapons being turned into gardening tools. It's at the heart of Jesus' parables. It is what in these stories both shocks and delights people, that those who work for one hour are paid the same wage as those who work for 12, that a son who has squandered half the family fortune should come back to a feast held in his honour, that people who beg or sleep under hedgerows should be invited to a royal banquet in preference to the literati and the glitterati. And at least in my thinking, it's what's sorely needed while we are still in the grip of the pandemic. So much has changed, so much has altered. And though people yearn to go back to living normally and business as usual, such yearning is tinged with suspicion. Because, because we now see in glorious profile that the old normal, in some cases, was abnormal. Do we go on to go back to believing that the only people who are important are the high wage earners? while the lowest paid attendants and care homes, security people, delivery agents have been celebrated for their heroism. Do we want to go back to the old normal where we believe that our health and social welfare systems were thoroughly British when the first frontline doctors to die through COVID-19, all but one were born in our former colonies? Do we want to go back to attention being heaped on medical research where the shots are called sometimes by global pharma, while the most basic form of cheap preventative medicine and behavioural practice are the stuff of the grossly underfunded and forgotten public health departments? Do we want to go back to the closure and the sale of school playing fields? and the underfunding and emotion and importance of the arts and secondary education, despite the proof, as in the case of the Sistema music projects in two Scottish schools, teaching children musical skill has benefited their whole educational attainment, encouraged cooperation rather than competition, and brought stability to demoralised communities. Do we want to go back to over-polluted cities, 
high use of personal motorised transportation and a neglect of the countryside? Do we want to return to a belief that we are a self-sufficient nation when so much of our industrial base, our food production, our consumer goods are dependent on trade with the very nations we have been keen to belittle? I could go on. What will deliver us from the new, uh, from the new normal being a slimmed down and stitched up version of the failed old normal, old normal is not, I believe, in the gift of politicians. No politician in any of the world's democracies was elected to deal with a pandemic or a post-pandemic world. None of them, and especially as in Britain, where the government represents a hegemony of public school boys in long trousers who have proceeded largely through Oxbridge into the law, the banks and political research, and hence into Parliament. It is in this situation that there needs to be a re-envisioning of the kind of nation we want to be, and creative endeavour as to what will make for the common good. And it's precisely in this endeavour that theology and the arts should join hands. Because theology is concerned at its most practical with the transformation of this world until it becomes reshaped according to the contours of the all-inclusive and world-affirming kingdom of God. And the arts are the means by which such thinking, such re-envisioning can take concrete form and permeate the minds of people who may be inured to the predictable chatter of the ruling classes. At this time, when we live in the shadow of racial brutality as evidence in the killing of George Floyd in the USA, people have had recourse to mention the name of Martin Luther King. And doubtless people will remember the speech at the Lincoln Memorial in which he spoke of a very different America. It's worth noting, as a Rhodes scholar did in his master's thesis, that what we remember was not what King intended to say. And that great day at the Lincoln Memorial, in front of hundreds of thousands of people, he had laid out as an intellectual the case against discrimination. He'd cited instances, quoted figures. He had fed the minds. And as a black preacher, he had roused the emotions. All through the speech, you can hear people from far away shouting at him. And having done that, he was finished. He walked away from the platform, from a microphone, and then he heard a female voice, that of Mahalia Jackson, saying, tell them about your dream, Martin. Tell them about your dream. So he went back. And drawing on some images he'd spoken about before, he began to articulate a very different America. A new day of friendship between the descendants of slaves and of slave owners. Different criteria other than skin colour on which children might be judged. It was not logic. It was not emotion. It was divine imagination that propelled people to believe in and work for a future different from the past. Someday sculptors will erect statues not of white military generals, but of black women who lovingly change the diapers of the diseased. Someday television companies will stop producing reality shows which delight in dysfunction and instead offer glimpses of what liberated potentials can do. Someday the Royal Ballet will put away its time-honoured props for Swan Lake and appear dressed for a performance of a new heaven and a new earth. Someday the Christian Church will supplement its creeds from the distant past with covenants committing us to radical transformation. Someday someone will write a song which begins not and did these feet in ancient times, but and will these feet in future years. <laughs>